And it's the pleasure to give the floor to David Rowe. David Rowe was the founding director of the University of Warwick Science Park, which he joined at its inception in 1982. Under his direction, the park developed to become one of the leading initiatives of its type in Europe, involving the participation of the University of Warwick and two local authorities. David Rowe led the park to innovate in the fields of enterprise development and technology transfer, and increased its geographical influence through the use of satellite sites, while also improving the financial sustainability of the organization. In March 2011, after 29 years being the CEO of the Science Park, David Rowe retired and formed his own business, Warwick Enterprise, to further his professional interest at a more leisurely pace. David, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure also to be on your track, even though that is on a more leisurely place. David Rowe, graag een applaus. Thank you very much for that introduction. It makes me sound too good. And thank you very much to the University of Maastricht for... Oh, sorry, oh no, okay, I'll let you go on. Uh, for inviting me here to talk to you on this opening ceremony day. I'm very proud to be invited because I have had a small association with Maastricht last year in which I came to understand just how eminent and significant this university has become through its relatively short history. And I'm familiar with universities that have short histories because Warwick also had a short history. It was a young university. And I know what it takes to achieve preeminence amongst your colleagues in other long established universities. So Maastricht has achieved a lot. So that's why I feel so proud to be invited here today. I'm choosing the subject of the role of enterprise in a modern European university. I will touch on many things, including science parks and other things, but I want to concentrate on enterprise what it means to a university and how a university through enterprise can contribute to helping a local economy to develop. So what are we going to talk about? I want to go through what the significance of enterprise is in the creation of economic growth, why it's important to a university anyway, and then to set that in the context of enterprise in the Netherlands. Every country is a little bit different in the way that it appreciates enterprise. And to look in particular at student enterprise and research-based enterprise. We'll come to those towards the end, but those are the two areas that I will go down into a little further depth. Now, enterprise. It is one of the five factors that classically economists understand as contributing to the phenomenon we call economic growth. And if we look at that diagram that you have in front of you, uh, two of them are largely the province of others and don't get, the universities don't get too involved. So setting competition policy is very much a national government activity. Investment. Investment in terms, of in, in terms of business is very much something to do with individual organizations, although an investment climate will be influenced by policies both at national and local government levels. It's the other three I want to concentrate on. Skills, innovation, and enterprise. These are three ways, three levers that can be used to stimulate an economy. They are interesting because they are often levers that governments delegate or authorize other agencies, organizations, to help them stimulate. And if you consider those three, they are three aspects of economic activity which universities have some 
contribution to make, and in some cases, a great deal of contribution. Skills, obviously, the highest level skills in an economy usually come through a university route. Innovation, increasingly over the last few decades, universities have been seen by governments all over the world as the primary source of new knowledge from which em innovation emanates. And enterprise. Enterprise, the way in which different resources are brought together to create something new. This, again, has become a province for the interest of a university, both in the way that it assists its students to understand how this can form a part of their later life, and also through the way in which they capitalize and commercialize on their knowledge base that they have created from research. Setting the scene a little bit more. Employment has been changing for many, many years. And that's having a profound effect on careers and the way that young people look at their future working life. They see today before them a probability that in their working life they will work with many different groups for many different employers rather than in years gone by when you might work for just one or two. Similarly, those same individuals may well work not only in the private sector or just the public sector, but a combination of both. Careers are going to be far more varied. Careers are likely to embrace enterprise at some stage. More and more young people see that their future will include enterprise, starting their own business at some stage, not necessarily during their university career, but at some stage in their life. So, we have the universities here. Uh, with increasing demands being placed upon them to meet the high level of skills that we need, have in our economy, because if we don't have high-level skills, we can't add the value to create our wealth. And through the research to provide a driver for innovation. But think about what governments are saying also to universities, and this is true across all of Europe and the developed world. They want universities delivering graduates at lower cost to the taxpayer. They want universities to do more to convert research results into increased business activity. They want to see universities integrated with all aspects and social infrastructures in our economies. It's a very important and tall order. It's demanding a lot from an institution which today has become very powerful across all of European communities, but nevertheless, it is requiring them to change in important ways the way that they operate. We need to take that into account as we go through the rest of the presentation. So, what are the ways that universities are drawn into enterprise? Students. From what I've just said, students are saying, in the future, enterprise will form part of our life quite likely. And indeed, in a recent survey of young people aged between 11 and 18 in the United Kingdom, 77%, 77% said that they thought they would start a business at some stage. That age group are the group that are going to move into universities. So... I think there's something there for the universities to work on. Enterprise in the exploitation of research results. Universities, research-led, research-based universities, have a profound wealth of intellectual capability, some of which can be turned into new businesses. Doing that efficiently is something the universities are increasingly coming to grips with. Enterprise in the broader community. So, many universities extend the sort of work that they do with their student body out into the entrepreneurship interest 
in the broader community, individuals who may not be part of the university but would appreciate having a relationship in helping them to start and operate a new business, particularly a new business with an innovative edge. And finally, there's enterprise within the university through entrepreneurship. How enterprising can a university be in the way that it delivers its mission? I'm not going to spend too much time on that last one, but I will mention something a little later on. Now, let's come back to the Netherlands and look at enterprise here. I've taken this data from the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor for the year 2010. It collects the same information from most countries in the world. And what I have done in this slide, is I have gathered together data just for Western European countries to make this analysis. Because I think that's probably the fairest set of uh, comparisons to make. To help you understand this slide, I will just point out to a couple of items. If you look at fear of failure, then you see that the Netherlands has the lowest score, and that is good. You do not want people so worried about failing to start a business that they don't ever start. The fact that the Netherlands has the lowest score is fantastic. You have a good... You, somehow your population has come to understand something about enterprise better than the rest of the world. It isn't something to fear. It is something to address. Then, at the other end of the scale, you have entrepreneurship. Is it a good career? And what do the population say? And in the Netherlands, you have the highest score. So the blue bars show you the range of all of the Western European nations, going from the lowest score to the highest score. And the orange bars for the Netherlands show exactly the total score that the Netherlands has. So in this one, people thinking that getting into enterprise is a good idea, the Netherlands is highest. So two things, low fear of failure, high desire to start a business, or thinking it's a good idea. In other respects across here, you know, how much exposure does the media give the whole idea of enterprise? Do the population, do individuals feel they have the competence to uh, run a business and to start a business? And do they see opportunities? Then the Le Netherlands falls somewhere happily in the middle of the spectrum for Western Europe. So overall, I would say that this is a good country for starting a new business. A few more bits of information. This TEA, Total Early Stage Entrepreneurship Activity, it covers a combination of those people who are in the process of starting a business, but they haven't yet started to trade. They have no income yet from that business. Plus, those businesses that have been trading for about for less than three and a half years. That's what TEA means. Well, again, we find that this actual activity by people in the population is high by Western European standards, well up into the top quartile. And if you look at what's called nascent entrepreneurship, and that is the, just the first part, that is people who are contemplating starting a business but haven't yet got an income. That also is, in the high, is above average. But that's an interesting one because this is an area where it is very easy to make a mistake and to fail before you really start. The fact that in this country, in the Netherlands, you have a high proportion, relatively speaking, of your population interested and getting involved at that early stage, there is a body of individuals there to work with to take them all the way through to the stage when they do start to earn an income from their business. 
Job creation expectations. That is asking people, when they, once they've started a business, how many people do you expect to be employing in five years' time? Good in terms, again, for the Netherlands. Now, two areas not quite so good. Innovation and internationalization. And when I saw these statistics, I was a little surprised, and I still would like to dig underneath these statistics to understand better what they really mean, because I, I still find it hard to believe. But what it says is that in terms of a business creating something, a new product or service, which is largely our, ab absent from the market, in other words, there are few competitors, Holland, Netherlands is only about average. And in internationalization, the expectation for a new business that it will have 20% or more of its sales outside the country is well below average. That does surprise me, and particularly given where we are today, just surrounded by it, uh, within a few kilometers, everywhere is another country. If there is something in these statistics Again, it shows dimensions where university action to help entrepreneurs would be very fruitful. And if I look at the internationalization one, I've had some very good experience working with Hörnigen University in the north of the country through the Zernike Group, which they created 25 years ago, and which has now become a private enterprise, helping start up businesses from the university originally to exploit their ideas internationally from a very early stage. I know it's a good program because I got them to come to Warwick and help me to embed it into the activity that we do there. And their methodologies work very well. So there are things that can be done and done fairly easily to improve that internationalization aspect. Limburg. All right. You've heard a lot about Limburg this morning. I have little to add to the details on Limburg, except that obviously you've been heard, hearing that it has an economy that is not doing terribly well. And I know that when you see that, it probably means that the entrepreneurship rate is lower as well. So fewer business startups and slower growth, smaller growth in the companies, small companies that exist will tend to be the sort of statistics you'd expect. But what the economy needs is innovation-led growth businesses with products and services that can be traded internationally. That's the way you get growth. And to do that, you need high-level skills. You can see where I'm going. This is the province of the university. So, Maastricht University is in a strong position to support enterprise, innovation, and skills objectives for the region. They are already highly active, and I won't go into all the list of all the programs, but there is a long list of programs. They do have an ability to spin out from the research base new companies, particularly in the life sciences, and we'll come back to that. They already license technology. Students do have an entrepreneurship program they can join. And there's absolutely no doubt that high-caliber graduates and postgraduates are educated through this establishment. So there is a huge contribution that Maastricht is already being made. Now, let's go to student enterprise. And you need to read this from the bottom up. This is saying, what are the sort of questions that students are likely to ask about the world of enterprise? Well, going down to the bottom, you can see it's things that are very much to do with you know, what, is, what it's all about. And then it moves up the list to how can you help me to do something about it. And the reason that we do it from the bottom up is because in terms of the numbers that you get involved in each of these stages, at the top you have the fewest number. And the numbers in that triangle give you a clue as to the ratios that you've got between those who take a, a generalist interest in enterprise and those who actually do something about it while they are still at university. Five minutes, okay. This slide I'm not going to dwell on, but I'm sure it'll be available afterwards. 
and you can see all the different mechanisms that you can employ to satisfy those interests and to help people to move, students to move up that interest, up the, up the, the levels to the point that where they do something about it. And the important thing for students is that getting some skills concerned with enterprise is improving employability. It's a highly transferable skills which employers recognize and like to see. Research-based enterprise, we can take a similar analytical approach. It's a very interesting subject area here, and there are some uh, global statistics about the amount of research it takes before you produce a patent, before you produce a spin-out company. It is significant amounts of money. It could be, it's probably over 15 million euros before you have the chance of a spin-out company from a university. 15 million euros of research expenditure. Now, this is not a cause and effect. We do not, in universities, spend money on research to produce spin-out companies as a production chain. We, research is undertaken to create knowledge, uh, to expand our, under, expand our understanding, and from that, great ideas emerge which can be commercialized. That's the mechanism that works here. And universities are tapping into that in order to create a structure to take those ideas through evaluation stages, to initial formation, to securing investment, and to having a company that employs people and creates wealth for its locality. Briefly, something on biomedical incubators. I want to show you some new research results that only came out last year in the UK, but I'm sure they're relevant to the Netherlands as well. And particularly uh, the biomedical incubators, because I know that with BioPartner uh, and um, Biomed Booster, this university is already heavily engaged in that activity. Now, it's probably rather more important than the university thought. If you look here, what this slide is telling you is that in, this is UK data, which I said probably relates to this country, that the number of businesses, small, medium-sized, small businesses that were started between 2000 and 2000, 2005 and 2009 uh, that existed on university-based incubators or science parks represented 44% of all biomedical startups in the country. That's a significant proportion. But even more important, the percentage of those companies getting some serious investment was 63% as against only 37 for companies that were not on university-related incubators and science parks. And the average investment was much greater for those in university-based incubators. And in the life sciences, particularly biomedical, this higher level investment is absolutely critical in getting those businesses to the stage where they become viable. You need high levels of investment. And the fact that university-based incubators are outperforming other locations by a considerable margin says something about the value of university bio-incubators. And I just want to add with something which I hope will take root here as a final closing thought. It's an activity that has been giving me a great deal of uh, uh, time, I've uh, devoted quite a lot of time and energy to thinking about and acting upon. I'm sure that at this university, like many others, young women make up a very high proportion of those studying life science subjects, probably more than 50%. Medical sciences, even more, probably. Uh, I haven't got the statistics directly for this university, but probably of that order, I guess. But when it comes to the formation of biomedical spin-outs, women are usually highly underrepresented in relation to the number of but their proportion to of the student body. But there's no reason why we shouldn't encourage them, because when women do get into business... All the statistics show they are just as successful as their male colleagues. 
So why are we failing to engage the interests of so many young women in this sector? I'm not going to stand here and talk for another half an hour giving you the full answer, and I don't think anybody has it, but I do know that a number of universities around Europe and the rest of the world are starting to take this agenda very, very seriously indeed, and are starting to develop methodologies which attract young women into these types of business. I know this is fertile ground, that I'm speaking to here in the university because I know that they've been running a program to get uh, called, I think, a, a women's business, pro, uh, business plan competition, which is open only for women here, young women. So I believe this is fertile ground. It's also important ground because with the way in which the university is getting into the healthcare, uh, the campus for, for, for healthcare shortly, uh, then this is going to be an added dimension in terms of creating the number of small businesses that can be located in this project by, through getting more women engaged. It will be a long process because any startup process is a long, takes a long time. But you can't afford to disregard this phenomenal resource that is not taking this agenda yet as seriously as they might. Thank you very much indeed. David Rowe, thank you so much. And uh, it's, it's good to know that we are still part of the Netherlands with such a fantastic circumstances for entrepreneurship. And it's also good to know that there are so many talented female students among us here at Maastricht, so the chances are favorable. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to have some coffee or tea. Uh, we will have a short break, and during that break, the presenters of today are available to address your questions, so don't hesitate to speak to them, uh, get some refreshments, and we will back, get back here for the second part of our morning program at 11.40 precisely. Thank you very much.